time. And your hands are spinning, hopefully. But what have I done to myself to go to this program? It's done very good, something good. So we are, this is our year 13 for this program. It's always my favorite number, 13. And for nine years, I think now, this has become a kind of uh, very good tradition to ask one of our heavyweights, academic heavyweights, with a white side. <laughs> That's why I was asking, show your white side <laughs> to come here. A man who has worked in the theater, he has uh, in media, but both brought both together as comparative literature and all this kind of stuff. And we are very uh, just past each other, you know. I was a second year student, left early when he came on there as an assistant for the professor I studied there, John D, who killed himself afterwards uh, uh, and hopefully not because of one of the three people. No, no, he, no, he was one of the, of the great Western scholars and his friends. But he went later to uh, Yale and Paul the Man became this uh, important uh, teacher and he is also the Benjamin share of EGS and Benjamin is also this uh, uh, guy uh, in there. So what a problem, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, please welcome Sam Lever. Thank you Wolfgang. Nine years already, huh? yeah. it goes fast. Uh, I know that many of you are a bit tired and uh, I'm sorry that uh, I have to apologize to start with that uh, this isn't a more, the talk I'm going to give is not a more uh, lighthearted one but it turns out uh, for various uh, reasons that it isn't uh, in part because uh, I, it, it's connected to a conference that was held a few months ago, it's not exactly the paper that I gave there in Leeds on uh, concentrationary uh, memories it was called uh, and then this is a sort of an outgrowth of that and it's also connected maybe to the fact that I've been spending a few months in beautiful Weimar Germany city of German classicism Schiller, Goethe, Liszt, uh, uh, Wagner and, and so on but also there's a little tower you can see from almost everywhere in the city on one of the hills surrounded a place called Buchenwald and uh, uh, I have to say that uh, I have never worked on anything connected with concentrationary uh, universes or so and so and when I had the invitation to participate in this conference in Leeds, uh, it seemed that it was the right moment at least to try to say something about it. Uh, the paper, this paper, as I say, is not directly the one that is connected there. It's a second one uh, that, uh, as you'll see, deals with uh, one of our dear colleagues here and my friend Giorgio Agamben who has written a very interesting essay on, a very influential essay on the question of the camp. And uh, again, I just sort of apologize that for this last talk that it couldn't be a little bit more lighthearted and so on, but I hope that nevertheless that uh, uh, it's not totally out of place. Uh, it's called Bare Life and Life in General. It's reassuring to think that it is possible to make distinctions that are clear cut especially where violence is concerned. It's reassuring because we like to believe that we can clearly and unequivocally distinguish violence from nonviolence, destruction from construction, killing from vivifying, death from life. It's reassuring, not least of all, because such clear-cut distinctions seem to give us a hold on whatever is being distinguished while at the same time keeping us at a safe distance from it. In his thought-provoking essay, but also highly controversial essay, What is a Camp?, Giorgio Agamben proposes an unusual but ostensibly clear-cut definition of modern politics, one that in turn reposes on a no less clear-cut definition of what he calls the camp. Up to now, he argues, the camp has been seen strictly as, quote, the place where the most absolute conditio inhumana that ever existed on earth has been realized. 
In the final analysis, it's the facts that count for the victims as for their posterity, end quote. Now, in contrast to this approach, which is not his, Agamben proposes to define the camp not on the basis of what he calls the events that took place there, but rather by asking, what is a camp? What is its legal and political structure such that such events could have happened there?" End quote. And the Gambin concludes, this will lead us to consider the camp not as an historical fact and as an anomaly belonging to the past, but as the secret matrix, the nomos of the political space in which we still live. Now this thesis makes two assumptions. First, that the conditions under which the events of the camp took place were essentially what Agamben calls political judicial in character. Second, that such political judicial conditions were not just necessary, but also sufficient to produce the events in the camp. Both of these assumptions, and above all their connection, which suggests that the political judicial sphere constitutes perhaps the necessary and sufficient condition of the camps, can and should, I believe, be challenged. I want to argue that they may well be necessary, but perhaps not sufficient conditions to describe the reality of the camps, which remain a reality that remains sufficiently diverse to resist assimilation to a single unitary essence and hence to a single unitary condition of possibility. Then as now, what I find important and very worthwhile in Agamben's approach is his effort to de-quarantine the camps by seeing their connection to a larger historical context and tradition. This is not to diminish the terrible singularity of the camps, qua institutions of genocidal extermination, Rather, it is to argue that singularity in general, and that of the camps in particular, remains a relational category, and that it therefore must be interpreted with respect to long-standing traditions and tendencies. To relate evil to phenomena that are often thought of as neutral or even as good is not necessarily to trivialize it, but rather it can be to take full measure of the force without which such evil could never have imposed itself. In short, the uniqueness of the camps should not be treated as something essentially isolated from other more widespread phenomena. Agamben's effort to locate the principle or essence of the camps in a biopolitical and juridical structure, whatever its merits and demerits, constitutes one such important effort. Such an approach is indispensable if one hopes to learn anything at all from the past that might enable us to avoid future recurrences. However, it is not enough, I believe, to merely describe a series of institutional developments, however significant they undoubtedly are, such, for example, as the elevation of birth to a biopolitical determinant of citizenship and simultaneously of the human itself, in order to account for the camps. Legal conditions must have the force to impose themselves on and as reality. More therefore than a mere description of juridical political institutions seems necessary in order to explain the force that was required in order to make the incredible violence of the camps a reality. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me slow down and first summarize what I take to be Agamben's argument in this essay. Here I want to single out three main points. One, quote, the camp, he writes, is the space that opens up when the state of exception begins to become the rule, end quote. Which is to say, the camp is designed to make durable a state that is initially conceived as temporary, namely the suspension of constitutional procedures in the face of a situation of exception. More abstractly, a political organization of space is designed to immobilize time as a medium of change. 
But the organization is highly unusual since it is based negatively on the suspension of otherwise existing legal restraints and guarantees. This situation of non-law makes the camp a place where, to quote Hannah Arendt's famous, but I believe highly misleading characteristic of the camps, in which, which in turn echoes the words of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, in which, quote, anything is possible. What Agamben does not develop is the introductory part of this, the famous utterance of the Grand Inquisitor. The entire phrase you probably remember is, if God is dead, then anything is possible. In what way a certain experience of the death of God could be a condition of possibility of the camps is a question I will seek to address later on in this talk. Number two, second aspect of his argument. Since the camp is a place where the usual legal restraints are no longer operative, it can be said to constitute a certain exteriority that is placed within the scope and power of a system. It marks, therefore, the inclusion of exclusion. And three, quote, through the fact that its inmates have previously been stripped of all political status and wholly reduced to bare life, the camp, he writes, is also the most absolute biopolitical space ever realized where the powers that be confront pure life without any mediation." End quote. The assertion that the camp is a space of pure and lethal violence without any mediation seems to me to reproduce precisely the state of mind that Agamben often attacks, namely that of a purely positivistic, fact-based interpretation. To this too I will return later on. It is this convergence of the juridical political state of exception with the biopolitical bio reduction of life as Zoe to pure or bare life, bios, that, according to Agamben, finds its institutional culmination in what he calls the camp, a space in which anything is possible. Now this phrase, anything is possible, takes on a special significance for Agamben. Whereas for Arendt, it was indissolubly linked to the death camps, for Agamben, it is expanded to apply to camps in general, including those that outwardly at least seem to have little to do with concentration camps. Agamben, and this was of course and remains the provocation of his talk and then of the essay, argues that the essence of the camps cannot be limited to the death camps, but should be extended to cover as well detention camps established, for instance, in international airports where stateless or paperless persons are held incommunicado for indefinite periods, or also to internment camps such as those established by the French government and then taken over by the Vichy government in the Second World War, or even, even gated communities in the United States. Presum presumably, he would also have to include refugee camps for displaced persons in this general category. Agamben's main point, however, is that the decisive quality that defines the camps is that its inmates or residents should be stripped of all legal protection and thereby accorded the status of bare life. I'm not sure that that applies to the gated communities. Uh, uh, not having spent a lot of time there. but. Uh. Um, to understand more fully this argument, one has to recall some of the other arguments more fully developed by Agamben and Homo Sacre, with respect in particular to bare life, that is, to the reduction of life as lived by individuals or groups to pure self-identity, to bare life. This is what Agamben sees at work in the Roman, uh, deriving from the Roman legal notion of the Homo Sacre, that is, a person who can be killed without incurring punishment and whose death or murder cannot be understood as a sacrifice and is also not punishable. The significance of this figure for Agamben derives from the fact that it exemplifies what he calls the originary political relation, insofar, namely, as the homo sacer embodies a sort of 
inclusive exclusion, his words, that allow it to serve, quote, as referent of the sovereign decision. Agamben thus adopts and adapts the notion of sovereignty elaborated by Carl Schmitt in his essay, Political Theology, in which the sovereign is defined as, quote, he who decides on the state of exception. Sovereignty defines itself as the power to decide when the, con- when the Constitution is to be suspended in order to cope with a state of exception that no system of positive law can fully anticipate or deal with. This notion of, of exceptionality reflects Schmitt's uh, antinomian conception of law as such. Law is antinomian for Schmitt insofar as it must seek to reconcile the general, upon which positive law depends, with the singular, required in order for the law to be applicable or enforceable. In other words, to be effective, law must be applied to singular cases, which, however, as singular, always introduce a gap with respect to the explicit formulations of the law. In short, in order to function, that is, in order to be law, cases must be submitted to verdicts or to judgments, and the German word urteil means both. In order to bridge the gap between the intrinsic generality of positive law and its singular application or enforcement, Schmidt therefore introduces the necessity of what he calls a decision that is no longer based wholly on cognitive judgment, but rather contains something like a leap of faith. It is this leap that makes law both intrinsically political and intrinsically theological, if you will, or transcendental, precisely by virtue of its lack of imminence. Uh, Between Political Theology, published in 1922, which defines sovereignty as the power to decide the state of exception, and the concept of the political, published in 1932, which defines the political as the the effect of what Schmidt calls the friend-enemy grouping, Schmidt implicitly introduces an element that will turn out to be decisive for Agamben's later revision and elaboration of Schmittian doctrine. That element is the act of killing. For if Schmidt understands the political in his 1932 book as a result of what he calls the friend-enemy grouping, the notion of the enemy entails the legitimacy of the act, the legitimation of the act of killing. The enemy is not yet the homo sacer, but he does share with him certain properties. He's alive, and as an enemy, it is legitimate to kill him, and you are not to be punished for it. The possibility of such legitimate killing, which does also does not involve sacrifice, of the enemy at least, is for Schmidt the, prerequis- the prerequisite of the formation and of the maintenance of all political entities. It should be noted that this does not mean, and Schmidt was clear about this, that the enemy should be exterminated. Enemies are required in order for the political to exist, and there should therefore be laws of of, of war um, regulating that. The extermination of enemies in general would equate for Schmidt with the end of the political. This does not, on the other hand, mean that individual enemies could not be exterminated, The enemy in general, as such, however, remains essential to Schmittian doctrine for the definition and survival of the political. Now, if we combine Schmitt's earlier notion of sovereignty with his later notion of the political, we can conclude that political sovereignty also entails the legitimacy of killing, not as an end in itself, but in order that a greater life, namely that of the polity, can be protected and maintained. The Schmittian enemy is thus theoretically at least, not, of course not chronologically, a forerunner of Agamben's homo sacer, insofar as it constitutes the external element that is internal to the polity insofar as it allows such a polity to constitute, define, and perpetuate itself. This is why Schmidt's formulation friend enemy grouping gruppierung in german is very precise although it's often neglected politics has to be seen as a result and a function of this grouping not simply of the enemy per se 
From this, two consequences can be drawn that bear on the question of the camps. First, one of the key moves made by Agamben, already anticipated by Schmidt and probably many others in different forms, is the introduction of the grouping of life and death as a decisive constituent of the political. What is implicit in Schmidt, however, becomes explicit in Agamben. Borrowing the term from Walter Benjamin, Agamben's biopolitics will redefine Schmidt's friend-enemy grouping as the grouping of bare life and death. As Agamben puts it, and I quote, the originary political element is therefore not simply natural life, but life exposed to death, naked life or sacred life, end quote. To become political, however, qua sovereign, this exposure must be transformed from a state experienced passively or merely endured to an act. Quote, again, the primary foundation of political power is a life absolutely exposed to murder, which is politicized through the possibility of being put to death. End quote. You didn't know you had such a bloodthirsty colleague here, huh? Yeah, very friendly person, but no. um, anyway, uh, that's to be criticized by Agamben, of course. He's now, if putting to death can thus be said to constitute the primary foundation of political power, one can see how something like a death camp could come to exemplify political power in an age of biopolitics. However, as we've seen, it's not this aspect of the camps, namely, it is not their exterminatory function that Agamben sees as decisive for their biopolitical exemplarity, but rather the way in which they contribute to making the state of exception the rule by treating their inmates as instances of bare life stripped of all individuating legal and political status. Thus, in terms of Agamben's general theory, biopolitics, and indeed politics in general, entails legitimate killing as the exemplary act of sovereignty. But the constitution of the camp, per se, he argues, cannot be reduced to such an act of killing, and hence to the organized extermination practiced in Nazi and other death camps. The latter is a revelatory and ultimate result of the process that leads to the institution of the camps in general, so Agamben, but it is not identical with its essence. This is the first consequence to be drawn from our brief, brief review of the theoretical context in which Agamben develops his theory of the camp, and it corrects, I would hope at least, in part, a reductive interpretation of this theory made possible perhaps by a reading of one short essay which appears to minimize, to minimize the function of extermination in interpreting the significance of the camps. But there is a second consequence that emerges when one reads and rereads the short essay in conjunction with the theory elaborated more extensively in Homo Sacer. The notion of political sovereignty that Agamben develops there is drawn from Roman law and hence has the Roman Empire as its primary political referent. But as an empire, the structure of political space seems quite different from anything like the confined and limited space of a camp. Agamben himself seems to say as much in the following observation, quote, the founding act of the city does not consist in the establishment of frontiers, but rather in their effacement or their negation. As the myth of the foundation of Rome says in its own way, but also very clearly, end quote. In other words, to the extent that the political can be derived from Roman models, its political space will tend to be expansive, even universalizing, rather than limited and concentrationary as with the camps. To be sure, Agamben conceives the function of the camps as that of providing a more durable form to the state of exception, but can this conception provide a satisfactory account either of the history of the camps or of their contemporary reality? Before pursuing this question, let me recall something of that history, and here I've had to really compress so as not to go on too long. Um, 
The early instances of concentration camps suggest that they developed not just as an elaboration of the state of exception, as Agamben argues, but more specifically as instruments in military conflicts of a colonial nature. The colonial dimension has recently been, has recently been shown to be decisive in the later elaboration of Nazi genocide and of the camps as, their primar as its primary instrument. During their colonization of Southwest Africa, Germany legitimated its war of annihilation by invoking its need for living space, Lebensraum, a term introduced in 1901 by the political geographer Friedrich Ratzel. German colonial policies were also legitimated by a rhetoric that treated native Africans as subhumans who had to be exterminated in order to create this living space for German settlers. And indeed, military operations against indigenous peoples systematically disregarded international rules of war and often deliberately aimed at annihilation of the enemy rather than as mere, at mere conquest. Such policies later were put into practice a scant half century afterwards in Eastern Europe, with this time Jews, Slavs, Communists as the primary victims. In German Southwest Africa, however, concentration camps were already created that anticipated in many essential respects those later established in Europe. They consisted both of internment camps and of extermination camps. One of the most notorious being the Shark Island Camp, Haifish Insel, which was referred to at the time by German troops as the Todes Insel, the Death, Death Island. Quote from a historian of this, operational from 1905 to 1907, Shark Island was the 20th century's first death camp. End quote. In both cases, genocide served the purpose of creating Lebensraum. In short, the killing in the death camps was organized with the intent of promoting the life of one group considered biologically and culturally superior by exterminating others considered to be inferior in both respects. We'll ret return to this in a moment. The model of the homo sacer and of bare life advanced by Agamben, however, seems to me unable to account for the selective process by which certain groups and not others were singled out to be victims first of the colonial and then of the Nazi killing machine. The biopolitical mechanism based on bare life may well have constituted a necessary condition for this process, but it remains to be shown that it was a sufficient one. For if colonized peoples and subsequently political and Eastern European groups um, were all denied legal protection before being imprisoned and killed, they were not at all excluded in the same way as the homo sacer, who presumably was and remained a, a, a Roman citizen and thus a member of the polity that permitted itself to kill him without penalty or punishment. What seems to me to be decisive here is precisely the fact that the criterion of such choices which surely bore a significant relation to a concept of life seems impossible to derive from any direct recourse to a notion of bare life as Agamben argues, especially if such bare life is understood as the simple opposite of qualified, differentiated forms of life proper to different groups of people. Rather, the notion of bare life as mere life seems to reflect more of the conscious ideology of the killers than the actual logic that informed their murderous practices. The African and then certain European and religious groups selected for annihilation by the Nazis were not chosen as representatives or embodiments of bare life in any sort of neutral sense, but rather on the contrary, as being inferior specimens of mere life, which is to say, of life in general, as being, in other words, subhuman, and therefore being inimical to its flourishing. It seems, therefore, that the opposition between Zoe qualified life and Bios bare life that Agamben regards as being so clear-cut 
does not really help us understand the specific forces driving the extermination policies that were implemented through the camps. It's instructive, therefore, to go back to Agamben's main source for his notion of bear life, namely to Walter Benjamin's use of this term in his essay toward a critique of force or violence. So, critique de Gavalt. The concluding pages of this essay, when Benjamin introduces and discusses the notion of bear or mere life, are among the most difficult that he ever wrote. And those of you who have read any of Benjamin will understand what that means. Such complexity prevents me from here going into this, the arguments unfolded by Benjamin there in any detail. I'll have to select and summarize, and, pro and certainly also reduce, simplifying. Mere life, which Benjamin in this essay also identifies with natural or physical life, he derives from what he calls their mythical violence, which in this essay he places at the origin of law, and which he sees epitomized in the punishment meted out to Niobe, which Benjamin describes as, quote, culpabilizing and atoning at the same time. Verschuldend und sühnend zugleich. He contrasts it with the divine violence that destroys the clan of Korah in the Bible, which in contrast he calls expiatory, entsühnend. Whereas mythical violence is blood violence, he writes, over mere life for the sake of itself, divine pure violence aims at pure life for the sake of the living, end quote. Like Agamben, Benjamin also introduces the notion of pure life in a discussion of violence, and in particular with respect to its relation to juridical systems. But unlike Agamben, for Benjamin, the decisive other of bare life is nothing that could be identified with zoe, whether as forms of life or as qualified life. Rather, it is named by two words that are difficult to translate into English. The first word is entzünend, and is opposed in the passage quoted to the word züne. The latter word derives from legal language and is associated with penance or penalty for something done. The word entzünend, by contrast, which by the way only exists in adjectival form and not as a noun, seems to aim at relieving human beings from the legal and moral burden of guilt and penance. It can perhaps therefore be translated as expiation if one thinks of that word as freeing one from the need to feel guilty and therefore to pay penance. The second word on which Benjamin's argument depends is equally difficult to render in English. It's the word das lebendige. It's difficult to translate, not just because the corresponding words in English and French, for instance, collapse a distinction that exists in German and that I believe is decisive for Benjamin's argument, even if he does not explicitly insist on it. In English, the translation would have to be the living, das lebendige. In French, le vivant. But these words efface the tension that exists between this word and another one, which is also used by Benjamin to determine a certain mode of life, namely die Lebenden, which is also generally translated as the living, das Lebendige, die Lebenden. The difference between the two is that whereas the latter, uh, die Lebenden, designates living beings, uh, the former, das Lebendige, Des, uh, the former, das Lebendige, signifies the quality of being alive. Mythical violence, and hence the legal and political system, has power, according to Benjamin, over the living as, as die Lebenden, insofar as from a purely naturalistic perspective, individual living beings can be considered to be imperfect instantiations of natural or bare life, which in this case means life in general. The species life. Life taken in its generative, self-identical generality. As bearers of bare life, individual living beings are naturally and inevitably mortal. But this is not enough to explain the connection between the living as individual living being and guilt and penance. To understand this, one must recall another myth, 
one which Benjamin does not mention here, but which I believe informs his argument implicitly throughout, although precisely remaining unmentioned and unmentionable. According to this myth, which Benjamin displaces onto Greek tragedy, human mortality is the punishment of human pride, hubris. But this is also rooted in quite another myth, namely, in the biblical and in particular Christian notion of original sin. What original sin implies is, first of all, an original sacredness of life as such, considered to emanate directly from the divine Logos. Life as originally created, pure and bare, is without death. Death appears in Genesis only as the result of man's transgression of the divine prohibition against eating from the tree of knowledge. In his 1916 essay on language in general and the language of man in particular, Benjamin interprets the fall as a fall from the immediacy of the divine name into the immediacy of ethical and cognitive judgment. Since this in turn involves the separation of singular living beings from the general concept and predicates of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil. In short, the biblical account in the first book of Genesis, in the biblical account there, life is originally without death. It is without death because it pertains not to individual living beings, but to instantiations of genres. Initially, God creates everything living after its kind. That's repeated repeatedly in the King James Version. And man is then called upon to give each kind its proper generic name. With the fall, each proper generic name falls into the language of judgment, of good and evil, and then of life and death. In the perspective of Genesis, then, life is originally pure, bear of all relation to others except to its creator. This, I believe, is the biblical origin of what Benjamin calls bare life. Death enters the picture only as a result of human action and transgression. At that point, bare life becomes mere life. This also means that, that the perspective of the singular and therefore mortal living being only imposes itself with the expulsion from Eden. Initially, man as creature is generic, created after his kind, and therefore pure and immortal. After the fall, he is guiltily and shamefully singular, vulnerable, mortal, naked, bare, outliving himself only through families, traditions, and polities. And I mentioned just in passing that the first named creator of, of cities is Cain. It just continues the relation of politics with murder and so on, and, and, and death. With the advent of Christianity, however, there reappears the possibility of undoing what has been done and of restoring mere life to its original essence as pure life. This sheds new light, perhaps, on what Agamben calls bare life and what I would call life in general. The following words of Paul, St. Paul, are cited by Hobbes in the Leviathan, one of the founding texts of modern political theory. Quote, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. End quote. The function of the state, the Leviathan, according to Hobbes, resides in the protection it affords to its citizens. But protection from what? If the modern European nation state develops in the aftermath of the wars of religion in which European Christianity decimate, was decimating itself in internecine strife concerning, among other things, the nature of salvation, of access to grace, then the concern with public safety and security that legitimates the existence of the modern nation state is tendentially at least oriented by the task of anticipating on earth what can only be fully realized with the second coming. Public safety holds the fort while awaiting salvation. 
And again, in, in parenthesis, I just note that in, the word around which both the civil society and political society, the, the bourgeoisie, is built is the root bourg, bourg, which means fortress and which is immortalized, if you will, in the most famous hymn of Martin Luther, Mighty Fortress is Our God, which stresses this defensive theological nature of civil and political society in the modern period. The so-called secular politics of the nation state would thus be constituted as the collective attempt to incarnate and preserve the meaning of the nativity while awaiting the second coming. The bare life of biopolitics would form the inner armature of politics in this sense, which I've called elsewhere the politics of protection. Protection is also one of the key notions in justifying the state of exception that for Agamben constitutes one of the indispensable conditions of the camps. As Agamben points out, the establishment of the first Nazi camp at Dachau was designed precisely to implement what was called protective custody, in German, Schutzhaft, a legal institution originally instituted in the 1850s in Prussia. Such protective custody departs radically from traditional penal law, since it imprisons people not on the basis of acts they've committed, but rather in view of acts they might commit in the future. Protective custody thus is based on an evaluation of an existential condition and as such is structurally linked, I believe, to the extermination camps, which punish inmates for their mere existence rather than for any specific acts they have committed. But the real and ultimate goal of protection in general, and of protective custody in particular, is, I believe, nothing less than that of mastering time and the future. To understand this, it helps to return one last time to the biblical perspective articulated in the books of Genesis. In this perspective, time reveals its destructive face only with the fall, with original sin, with guilt, and above all with its consequent mortality. Time thereby reveals a double aspect. It serves both as the medium of the creation by which human beings and the world realize themselves individually and collectively, but it also serves as the medium of perdition by which everything passes and uh, passes away. The balance of power between these two facets of time is marked by at least two radical turning points in history. First, by the rise of the Christian perspective of redemption and resurrection. Time, the medium of perdition, of labor, and of loss, also becomes the medium of potential salvation, of the second coming, and thus the medium through which mortality can eventually be overcome. And second, with the emergence of the Protestant Reformation, protesting initially, at least, against the commoditization of salvation through the selling of indulgences. For Luther, grace is no longer accessible through good works alone. Its access becomes far more uncertain. In response to this uncertainty, the politics of protection, protective custody, and finally preventive and preemptive strikes and wars of all kinds seek to parry the destructive menace of an as yet unredeemed future by trying to reduce it to the present. The recent emphasis on the short term in financial speculation uh, can also perhaps be productively investigated in this theological economic context. The notion of bare life, although relevant, is in itself hardly sufficient to explain how the notion of salvation through protection could develop the force that enabled it to impose mass destruction and extermination technologically, politically, economically, and institutionally through the establishment of camps as well as by other means. Those who were taken into protective custody and ultimately killed were annihilated because they were deemed to pose a threat to life in general as it was articulated and specified in a particular unified body politic. To be sure, that unified body, body politic was always a particular one, and this came to be justified in terms of the maximation, maximization of life in general, of life as self-generating. 
the lethal reduction of individuals to members of peoples and groups in concentration camps, but also elsewhere, thus sought to put death to death, a formula I note in passing that another EGS colleague, Alain Badiou, has invoked to describe the Pauline conception of resurrection in his book on St. Paul as the foundations of universalism. In this context, it is perhaps important to recall that the death of Christ, through which the guilt of man is potentially redeemed, is recounted as the result of a violent act of human beings. As the driving force in the rejection and killing of Christ, the Jews could be identified with the forces that affirm the inseparability of death from life, and a certain priority of the law over and the letter over grace and the spirit. To kill death could thus logically come to mean to annihilate the Jews. If the notion of bare life could become, as Agamben argues, a lethal machine, the driving force beyond that becoming was perhaps a desire to save life as lived by singular living beings through sublimating it to a life conceived of as being lived in general. Life in general can be construed as self-generating prior to and independently of death, but life in the singular cannot. Life in general, however, is only life when it assumes a particular, nameable, identifiable form. A mediating instance was therefore required in order to establish the possibility of the sublimation, that is, of saving the singular by generalizing it, absorbing it into the general. The name that this form assumed in the modern period is more often than not that of the people and in particular of a homogeneous people unified by ties of blood and soil, the biopolitical bio outgrowth of the criteria of modern citizenship, namely birth and territory. But which people could claim, uh, lay claim on being the decisive agent and embodiment of life in general? If the essence of such life in general could only be manifest in its capacity to kill death, that is, to expunge death from life by eliminating all those who were associated with the irreducibility of a relation to death, then the status of a people to defend and protect life in general would have to be demonstrated in terms of its ability to eliminate that people as the enemies of life itself. Only in this way could the anxiety before the irreducible link between death and life in the singular be temporarily at least attenuated. Perhaps this is also behind what has often been called the domination of nature more generally. And perhaps it's also why militarization in general and the militarization of Germany under the Nazis in particular was informed by the goal of annihilating the enemy. If so, then this could provide a different context in which to explain how and why camps could emerge as one of the key figures and institutions of such a policy. The death camp concentrated in order to exterminate, just as the forces of life in general sought to seek and subdue and absorb what they take to be exterior and inimical to life itself. The camps could thus be seen as the institution that sought to and seek perhaps to quarantine the forces of death in order to protect and assure the triumph of life. The camp could then be described as the lethal side of an impossible politics of salvation. Thank you. December 21. Huh? Second coming is coming. Uh, December 21, right. they promised us. Right. So winter solstice. Work. And actually, my name is Kane. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on the Kung Fu side, you know. One <laughs> Mr. Universe and whatever your camp is. Nothing to do with it. Okay, but it was a very, you right, strong ending. No question about it. So, guys. Do you have brain cells left? <laughs> I'm not so. Please help me out here. Yes. Um, you started this talk by saying that it was built off of a lecture that had to do with 
with um, concentration area memories. Yes. Um, and I wondered about um, an aspect of nightmares and uh, these memories, and also if you know elements that could be reduced in these nightmares. One of them being the impossibility of this effort towards salvation. That part of what's so disturbing about it is yeah. that it was an impossible effort in the first place. Yeah. Not just that it was demeaned people to bear life in your life. Yeah. It was like it was, an, it was a pointless goal in, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to talk about. It. Well, it's a sort of a, a whole other. Yeah, in fact, that's somewhat related to the other the other paper that I gave, and where I, I, I tried to make a link. I tried to explore the notion of concentration. In, so, uh, for example, as a mental activity, uh, and and uh, to try to uh, uh, see a, a link between concentrating and and concentration in various in various senses, not to the reducing the one, but to try to see if there might be a connection between the the effort to concentrate in various ways and uh, mentally and so on and uh, and um, um, now the, the 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 kind of nightmares that you're referring to is something different, but the link I was interested in is trying to to suggest that between uh, very very common and necessary mental activities in which we concentrate on something and we exclude other things therefore you see that the exclusion of other things in order to concentrate on something uh, might have a, it's a del delicate argument but there might be uh, you know a connection being made between uh, that that mode of thinking particularly when it becomes exclusive and and and, and intolerant of any other kind of thinking um, and and concentrationary practices uh, uh, and, and institutions but uh, what you're describing now is something uh, interestingly different. Um, uh, in both cases, uh, I have Freud in the background. Freud, uh, Freud uh, uh, in, in the one case, Freud describes concentration as very, in some way very related to a defense mechanism he calls isolating or isolation, and which he comes to believe is maybe as important as repression. In, now, in the case of memory, uh, uh, in the case of isolate, what he says is, in, in the case of isolation, you don't need to actually repress a thought the way you do in repression and replace it with something else. What you do is to simply cut it off from its connections, and in so doing, it no longer is is conflictual and therefore can be can be uh, uh, you know made accessible to consciousness. You see. And uh, I, this strikes me as very, very interesting, uh, an interesting way of, of talking about how uh, uh, inf information is manipulated in a liberal society. You know, Freud's example of repression is the czarist press, which you can say for kind of totalitarian, where a newspaper appears with holes in it because things have been... In the case of repression, it's more complicated, though, because you don't have a hole. You have a word replacing or a thought replacing another one. So it's already more complicated. But in the case of, of, of isolation, you have the thing itself is appearing, you have an, uh, but it appears in such a way that you can't make other connections to it, you see. So in a certain sense, it, 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 it links up with memory in two different ways. Um, it links up with memory in that, on the one hand, it becomes easy to memorize because it's isolated from everything else. But it also links up with a form of memory that is involved, with, that is includes forgetting, because and that is what Freud calls a screen memory. A screen memory is when you remember something, an image or a thought or a scene, uh, at the expense of, re which is there to, to to prevent you from remembering other things. You see, in in the course of an analysis, for example, uh, after a certain period of time, uh, he 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 would recount that analyzans would then wind up repeating the same, you know, come to the same uh, stock of memories that they, that they had, and uh, this he realized was a defense of some sort. It was a, what he called a screen memory. In German, it's a deck erinnerung, which is a cover memory. But the idea of screen in English is even more rich. I think it screens out. It's a screen on which you project. And, but it's the idea of it, and um, um, so he, there you get a kind of a repetition of the same thing in order for certain other things not to be not to be remembered, if, if you know, if, if you will. So uh, and I, now uh, the traumatic repetition of uh, traumatic memories is, I think, related to that. 
or could be related. I'm not, I'm not a clinical uh, analyst or psychologist, so I'm, I'm, not, so I'm not certain about that. But uh, at least from what I've read, it can be seen as a way of trying to uh, both re-experience, establish a certain mastery over the traumatic event, even though it, 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 it caused it, even and because it caused great pain and 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 uh, and. and and, and, and difficulty. But in all cases, you see, you're, you're confronted with the idea of, uh, if you will, inclusion and exclusion, selection, focusing, uh, relations, and so on. And, um, uh, uh, and, it's the, and so this, is, this seems to me to sort of be the, the problem that, that this whole, that, that, that I was trying to explore act actually uh, with this uh, notion of concentration there. Yeah. In other words, concentration in order to control. When you have uh, internment camps, as in uh, Algeria and by the French or in Vietnam or whatever, you know, you, you, or, or the Spanish in Cuba, the first concentration camps that were at least so-called, you know, you group rural population, for example, which is spread out and which can become a kind of a, a, a resource for guerrillas, for uh, partisans and so on, and you group them in fortified areas so you can control them. See, so the, and this is the model that Freud also is describing, but what he does there is to relate it to ordinary thinking, to, to sort of logical thinking where you concentrate on, on an object, you see. And uh, just to, to complete the response, I'm working on a project called uh, Toward a, a, a Politics and Poetics of Singularity, and, uh, I, and my, I have a certain amount of experience in dealing with poetry. And what I want to try to show is that in certain types of poetry, uh, poetic language, language, you know, it's a way of, uh, of, of problematizing this process of reduction through seeing how individual words can, uh, you know, uh, can contain uh, all sorts of uh, ambiguous and ambivalent relationships uh, that are not simply reducible to univocal statement or an object or a concentration there. So, I mean, that's just to sort of give you a little bit of a perspective on some things that I'm that, I, that I'm working on. <coughs> Steve. Um, we talked a little bit about the American security state, Guantanamo, and the treatment of gravity behind I mean, in the context of what, well, the American security state is obviously what's in the back of my mind in, 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 in all of this. That's both an advantage and a disadvantage, I suppose. But I mean, I was more, you know, I was, I was very, you know, at the, at the time very uh, impressed and worried about the 2002, I think it was, national security statement. Of which justified basically preventive, you know, war and preventive, uh, and, and 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 so on. Uh, so that, uh, but yes, I mean, Guantanamo is protective custody, you know, and it's um, it really is forgotten. You know, I just I, since I'm in Weimar, I get a chance to you know watch German television, and they do have documentaries on this. And I just recently saw one about you know the, the establishment of the, the taking of power in 1933, and you know the people, all the communists and socialists and unionists were rounded up and put in protective custody. That was the word that was used, Schutzheim, and so on. And uh, uh, in, in uh, you know, and then there was a, there was a Reichstagsbrand. There was a fire in the you know the, the famous fire of the Reichstag that was used to justify this threat, a little like the Twin Towers. You see, so not that I'm you know, and even though today you know today we don't know, I don't think it's not very clear just where that came from, the right start point. I mean, maybe some of you know better, better than I do. It keeps being batted back and forth and so on. But uh, um, at least for, you know, uh, the result of the Twin Towers attack on September 11th uh, was is somewhat similar with the Patriot Act yeah. and, 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 uh, and the uh, unquestioned, the continuing unquestioned uh, strengthening of the military, com you know, military spending a country is bankrupt. The country increases the, by far the largest expense is military, and and it's absolutely uh, impossible for it even to be discussed in the political realm. You know, so all of that is, uh, and for that, you know, the stuff I was I was you know recounting about Schmidt is unfortunately very apt to describe. You know, you have a, you have an, an enemy who's amorphous, and you need uh, an infinite amount of the militarization to uh, you know to, to prevent to cope with it, and so on and so forth. 
But yeah, I think it, it, I think that the Guantanamo is the example of that. There is no clear legal, you know, it's a mili military, a military type prison in a in a very unconventional, you know, not, not covered really by the Geneva Convention. I mean, Guantanamo is still a, a contested site in that there are certain uh, principles of military justice. Yes, that's right. true. But in the case of Bradley Manning, it's, I think we've gone to the extreme. I don't know if you've read the accounts of his treatment where he's kept naked in a cell and uh, yeah. awakened every 15 minutes to make sure he doesn't kill himself. And there too, you know, the justification is, is protection. Yeah. He's considered to be suicidal, so and so he has to be put under, you know, lights 24 hours a day, observed, and so on. But it's, oh, this is the thing, the, 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 unquestioned, the unquestioned invocation of protection. This is what the state is doing. It, you know, the, the exercise of force and violence uh, uh, legitimated by the, the, the need to protect. And I, I think that's, that's uh, you know, that seems to me was very, very uh, determinant today. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to words, I was wondering uh, if all the ambigui ambiguity that is involved in camp, if the word camp is related, because you, you talked about the barrenness of life and there's different uh, possibilities of understanding it. One is also the nakedness. Yeah. yeah. So you need protection, you need to cover it. That's right. But what about camp? Because if if the word is related to the Spanish word camp, in yeah, Spanish, campo, campo. And, it's the openness and not the exactly. Practice, so I don't camp, know. the campus, yeah, the so American I campus. I mean, it has, yeah, no, it, and and the campus now is, by the way, in the in the United States. I, my sense is, it's now slowly becoming more an industrial. You know, you have the Google campus and the Microsoft campus, and uh, so it's, you know, it's 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 shifting into a kind of uh, new industrial, uh, you know, entrepreneurial form. But even you know, even I don't know how it is in, in Spanish, but in the case of, in the in the case of the campus, it definitely is delimited, and in French, at least, a champ is not completely open. There's always a delimitation, but it does, you know, it does suggest uh, uh, a certain, um, uh, you know, it can suggest a certain liberty, I guess. Or, but my, my sense is that the institutionalization of, of camps and maybe of campuses are, is very largely informed by the idea of the need to protect, the need to delimit, to separate, and to protect, you see, uh, a space. Yeah. At least in, in the, you know, in, 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 in most of the cases, you know. But then you, it's true though. In the, I think in the, as I remember now, if I haven't looked at this, this lecture I gave in Leeds. I think I started talking there about my experience with summer camp. Yeah. You know, which in French is interesting. It's called colonie de vacances, which is all you know, colonies and so on. So each language has its own, you know, its its own its own quirks. But uh, you know. Uh, uh, it, it is, I mean, I think Agamben, you know, is really onto something in pointing to this as a very significant redefinition of a kind of collective institutional space. I just, you know, don't entirely agree with the, 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 the uh, juridical, making that uh, the, the sole criterion either, you know, of, of, of it. It seems to me much more varied than, you know, than that. Uh, you know. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, have a, <clears throat> I have a question about uh, your reading of Genesis. Um, I'm very interested in the, this question and how it relates to, to bear life. Um, uh, partly that uh, one of the things that's unique about the creation myth in Genesis is that the snake is kind of the villain. Whereas in other cultures, creation myths, the snake is the, the one who guarantees eternal life, precisely because snakes were thought to shed their skins and live on. Um, so that there's a kind of screen there or, or nudity involved. But that uh, Agamben has written about, um, about the Garden of Eden in his essay on, uh, on nudity, where he if I remember right, he says that Adam and Eve weren't actually naked. They were clothed already in grace. 
and that um, I don't understand. I mean, I haven't read. It. I know the book you're referring to. I haven't read that, but I, uh, it's hard to understand how they could be clothed in grace, since grace seems to be something that presupposes uh, the fall. Yeah. Well, that's maybe you know. Maybe that's but yeah, I mean, he's critiquing a particular theologian. I forget his name. Mm -hmm. Peter, somebody. Mm -hmm. But um, that there's a. You know, he was he was pointing out some of the internal mm -hmm. paradoxes here yeah. that they're already they're already clothed in the garden, and so I find bare life to be a very tricky concept to <laughs> to pin down. I've read a, a dozen really really smart theorists who all mm -hmm. seem to have a different take on it. Yours yeah. seems to be life in general. Yeah, right. But the, the question I wanted to ask you is is what's underneath this clothing of grace? I mean, it, to me, it seems like. Their life is something that isn't quite reachable. You, if you strip, if you strip someone down, there's always another layer of something. I mean, my my uh, uh, my response to that is what's underneath is singularity, alterity, heterogeneity, difference, all of those things, and that. As I read it, I, I just can I can only consult uh, the King James version or some of you know I don't know uh, Greek or Hebrew, so I can't. Uh, but as far as as I read it, there uh, the, the interpret the, the the premise of a monotheistic Creator God, or, you know, sets the uh, it sets the benchmark for purity, and that everything then follows in the you know in the in the paradigm of that. Uh, absolute identity. Now that may be a naive reading, and I know, I know the theological tradition has been much more complicated than that. So, you know, but when just reading Genesis, that seems to me, and therefore, you know, that the, so that nakedness is pure life in general, up until the point where it is uh, recognized as nakedness, which means exposed to the other uh, through the fall, uh, and then closed by, you know, uh, in shame. So w you have shame, guilt, transgression, mortality, all of that coming together to define bare life. That seems to me to be... Uh, so there's a, there's a distinction here which I, I didn't make sufficiently clear, I think, and I, I'm still working on this, on this paper, which would, be, would, be, would be, which would be between pure life and bare life. You see? The, uh, pure life is life that is just life. And then bare life is life that has been exposed and that's, and that's, and that's uh, naked. Uh, yeah. and, and then, uh, bare, so there are three terms in, in English that have to be considered pure life, bare life, and mere life. You know, and I'm just trying to to work a little bit. Uh, sort of, they go. You know, uh, bare life and mere life seem to me to be to be related and to be the other of pure life in this reading of of, of Genesis. And it's, you know, it's also interesting. And I, you know, it's, I'm not in a position really to give a very profound reading of it. But that you have the tree of life next to the tree mentioned, and next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see. Yeah. What is wrong about nudity? Uh, <laughs> Just not. <life>. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget protection tonight. And have a good, have a good trip back. You have been a great group, and I will be punished for it in August. And 90 of you are sitting here, so I will try to get my evil side out more stronger than so. But thank you for having a pleasant experience here and have a safe trip back. Bye.